uh, yeah you can, we can start now okay good afternoon to one and all once again uh, to this very important lecture series that is uh, jigasa popular lecture series and we are organizing lecture number 3 and today we have two speakers with us dr ayan kumar bandhapadai and dr rajendra kumar verma so uh, before starting their lecture i have one announcement for the audience you please uh, post your queries uh, in the chat box of youtube so that after the speakers completes their uh, like their topic they will come back to the chat box and answer your queries so with this i am very pleased to introduce our very first speaker for today he is dr ayan kumar bandhapadai is who is currently working as principal scientist in the central electronics engineering research institute pilani india he has done his msc and mtech in microwaves from bardhaman university bardhaman west bengal in 1998 and 2001 respectively he has obtained his phd from otto von gerich university germany with distinction and has worked as a postdoctoral fellow in the european synchrotron radiation facility esrf france his current research interests includes design and development of microwave components systems high power microwave tubes antennas millimeter wave vacuum electron devices and components and today he will be delivering a very important lecture on 5g technology the impact and the expectations so with these words i welcome dr anand padai please deliver your lecture thank you so uh, thank you vijay for your kind introduction so let me share my screen so i hope the screen is visible to everyone yes okay now i'm making it full screen so i hope it is uh, visible yes so welcome everyone to our uh, lecture to this uh, very uh, important jigasa lecture series popular lecture series so today our topic is 5g technology the impact and expectations so we have chosen this topic to for our uh, little friends who will be just completing their school or in the school so that they can have a you know, understanding about 5g what 5g is just for this this purpose so the outline of the talk is as follows so first uh, we will discuss about uh, communication technology in the introduction part how it it evolved and then the expectation from 5g and how the generations of the mobile phone evolved and then the technological components of 5g as we expect and then the impacts and application areas of 5g of course it will not be a complete application areas or complete impacts some glimpses of the applications which are people are talking about or which are about to happen in very short time in our country as well as well as global so let us start with the part communications communication is a very common thing that whatever i am thinking if i want to discuss with someone else then i will have to communicate with them so the part is there are many types of communication but the part is the communication part the two parties who will be communicating they must be understanding each other and some information must flow from one point to the other point the most common uh, form of communication is the oral communication since our birth our childhood we always communicate with people sometimes verbally sometimes with some languages or some science also uh, uh, we we communicate with each other now the oral communication this part is limited because when the parties who are communicating with each other they are very near to each other then oral communication as such is very effective but when two parties are very apart from each each other geographically distant locations at that part communicating with each other each other is becomes a problem it cannot be done orally for that we need to have some means so that we can send some useful information which is mutually understandable for 
both the parties so that we can send from one point to other point so that one sends the signal or one sends some information and others understands it correctly. So this is the purpose of communication and telecommunication is when we are doing it uh, at two, two points which are geographically far apart. Okay. From ancient times, we will be seeing that from ancient times, this type of communication is telecommunication is taking place. The first communication might happen in the prehistoric time with fire beacons using the fire and maybe the smoke to signal something that something is happening here or something is going on there. The second uh, modern communication, it dates back to the Roman emperor, the era of the Roman emperor. So there they were envisaged or they, have, they developed some means of communicating with uh, the mirrors for which re reflects the sunlight to signal from one point to another point. This, this signaling, signaling process, it was also used uh, in the military up to the world wars. So via some mirrors, because it is very inexpensive type of communication and very effective. But the thing is that the two points must be line of sight, means there should not be any obstacle between them. Otherwise, the communication will not happen. Another very important and interesting uh, form of communication happened using the carrier pigeons where the pigeons were transporting mail and of course in the mail there were letters so their informations were uh, transported from one part to another part but this is literally physical transport of data uh, in the form of mail okay then there are also telecommunication using the semaphore type of systems where there is a mast and there a, a vertical and horizontal uh, strips of wood or metal were attached and each of the orientation of this uh, this wood uh, would signify some letters so if any person is seeing it from a distance via a telescope or something like that and these things are changing then he can he or she can decode some signals. So that was the semaphore type of uh, communication that was also used for quite a long time before the advent or before the invention of the electricity. But afterwards, so it was around say 17, uh, 1792 to 1850s, this type of systems were used for telecommunications. And afterwards, the electricity came into picture and electrical telegraph was invented. And from 1840, Till 2013, means still uh, for some years, these telegraphic systems were there where we could send some electrical pulses through such devices from one place to another place. So there were some signs or uh, there are some symbols which were uh, represented by the uh, the dots or by the time the time which these two electrical pulses were sent, and by decoding those pulses, one could uh, uh, decode a message and then the message was delivered um, through uh, through post office by in form of a uh, mail okay so that is the telegraphic system and around 1876 the first analog telephone was invented and it was evolved through uh, from then and it was also with wire and the electrical signal, it is the audio signal, which was then converted into electrical signal and the electrical signal was transported through the wires via analog technology. Okay, so this technology is still now in use. And uh, then, so up to this part, the, the, the electrical telegraph and the telephone, they were wired telephone. But after that thing, in 1886 between 1886 and 1889 very important discovery happened so there was a famous uh, german scientist henrik hertz he discovered that electromagnetic waves which are characterized but by its frequency they can be originated from the electrical equipments so details of this will be uh, presented in a later lecture by uh, dr parma uh, so he effectively what was his discovery was that 
the electromagnetic waves can be generated through the electrical signals that and uh, it can be it can be transmitted so in 191894 sir jc was used those electromagnetic waves to uh, fire a gun some gunpowder and ring a bell effectively demonstrating that these wirelessly we can transfer some data from one place to another place so basically these two inventions this led to modern wireless communication uh, that is radio telegraphy and modern wireless communications so from here we can see that the electromagnetic waves which is something like the light wave but uh, the light that we use every day uh, but the frequency is different frequency means how many times it changes it, its uh, sign okay so electromagnetic waves they are uh, alternating waves so it changes its sign and the it is represented by hertz okay the unit of the frequency is hertz so optical signals which we will see uh, that which we generally see in our daily lives they have a very high frequency and the frequencies radio frequencies which are used for wireless communications these are comparatively of lower frequency than of the optical signals optical uh, waves so afterwards the mobile telephone the g's that we know that we have a telephone of uh, 1g and then we had the telephone of 2g and then 3g then 4g and now the 5g is coming some of the cities or some of the countries the 5g is already have started so this g they are they basically stand for generations so why all of these g's people who are having the first generation then why we needed the second generation or third generation the answer lies in the fact that for example in uh, in the physical world also we are having say our grandparents and then comes the parents and then the children okay and the general form is that when the generation comes the they are they are smarter in appearance than the previous generation they are faster in communication for from their previous generations and they are usually more intelligent than the previous generation so this thing is also true for the mobile uh, communication system the generation of the mobile phones or the networks they became smarter they became faster and they became more intelligent in communication uh, point of view so therefore the generation of the mobile phones are evolved so it means this this first generation was smarter than the analog or the wired telephone then the second generation is smarter than the first generation and so on for example we can see here this is a photograph of the first portable phone we cannot really say it mobile phone because it was around weighing around 1.1 kg and it needed around 10 hours to have full charge on this mobile phone and we could talk only 30 minutes with that phones which was which was uh, in the market in the in 1973 now if we compare the mobile phone that we are having now this is i have taken from the internet the photograph of a latest mobile phone that is a folded mobile phone and uh, we can see the appearance appearance wise how smarter it is and of course it is faster in communication and it can do many more things uh, behind uh, beyond the first uh, mobile uh, phone that is depicted here so let us have a quick look how the generations or the g's of the mobile phone it evolved so first it was the analog technology the first phone that was uh, shown in the previous uh, slide also so it could uh, it could send uh, the voice and text but it was only limited to national connectivity means if someone changes its country he or she need to have another type of phone because the networks were not connected or the way of communication in one country was different than in other country okay now in the second generation so here we had the first digital technology with global connectivity this means one person could place a call from here to anywhere in the world that was a big leap 
in the technological wise because the all the standards and the uh, the uh, the network uh, parameters they had to be harmonized means they should be similar to the in both countries to have a international connectivity so global connectivity was achieved but still what we could send was only voice and text the third generation of uh, mobile phones so first internet connectivity was there so it could connect to internet in very restricted uh, manner and multimedia message service were also enabled and uh, the internet connectivity was there but it was not very good in the 4g here we were we are having now high speed internet connectivity and also we can do many of the things which people can do in the normal uh, computer with internet connectivity and one thing which is drastically different from 3g and 4g is the 4g phones using the 4g phones the ne network connectivity and the speed of the internet connectivity was sufficiently high that people can now use the uh, video calling this is when we are doing a just a voice call and when we are doing a video call the basic difference is via video call we have to send a tremendous amount of data compared to the simple voice call and now comes the 5g phones so here not only internet will be connected we will be connecting many things together and many services together and many user equipment and networks we can connect so that would be the integration of many things and many technologies together via the framework of the 5g so therefore what is how it is different means uh, i am telling that okay the every generation was having uh, something which is better than the previous generations then what is the big thing about 5g the 5g thing the big thing is that up to 4g the mobile network evolved utilizing available technologies whenever there was a upgradation in the technologies that was implemented in the in the network and therefore the speed was uh, speed was uh, getting much better but in case of 5g it went the other way around so first people has identified what would we like to do with our network we would like to send how much amount of data we would like to integrate how many networks together and we what what are the basic functions of the network that we would be evolving then according to that people sat together note down these things and then the technology has been evolved to support that network this means that the network criteria of the network it was chalked down first and then the technologies were uh, evolved and developed to fit into that uh, network and that is still evolving okay so now what are the expectations so as i told before that the here in the 5g case first we have uh, pointed out the applications and then from those applications we know that okay uh, it is something like that uh, we want to say transmit a video within 5 seconds so from there we can make out that how much should be the bandwidth of the of the system how much should be the latency latency means delay of the system so means we ask for a uh, data and the data is available to us in how much time means how how much is the delay in connections okay that is called latency so here we have first the applications were studied then the operating parameters were extracted from them then the standards were developed and then the technologies and then the 5g network now what are the standards standardization means since now we want a global connectivity this means that the mobile phone that we will be manufacturing here it should be at par with someone in some other countries doing a mobile phone so the parameters of those mobile phones like the operating frequency like the bandwidth like the you know, power 
and uh, uh, the the part of the network, the network protocols, they should be the uh, should be same, you know, so that we can connect with each other. Otherwise, we won't get a global communication. So, therefore, the the stakeholders, stakeholders means who are involved, who will be using those networks or who are interested in those networks, like the users, the companies which will, for example, the network operator companies and the interest groups and also the standard organizations of governments. They sit together and they discuss and they chalk out what can be the specifications of the network for different uses. Okay. And the benefit of the standardization, once we have such, uh, such a standard that uh, so everyone knows that what is to be delivered or what is to be, uh, what is to be manufactured or how the network should look like. So it maximizes compatibility among all uh, global compatibility. Interoperability means if some network provider says, that, okay, I will not be giving the network um, services, so the other network operator can come, means you can change the network uh, very efficiently. Then global competition, ensuring innovation. Innovation uh, means uh, evolving new things, new uh, components of the uh, for communications and also increasing the safety, reliability, and quality of the uh, service, okay? So for these things, in 5G, what happened that uh, the applications were, were first uh, chalked out, and then the standards were derived, and then the technology has been evolved, and ultimately we will be having, or we are having, the 5G network. Now, so, so far, what I have seen, uh, what we have seen, that 5G is not a mobile network like the other Gs. The other Gs were just a mobile services. But 5G is something like a framework which will connect with different services. For example, which will be connect uh, connecting the banking sector services with your mobile phone, or some environmental monitoring things with a server or you can check the running status of a train from your mobile phone. These things will be coming. So many networks will be connected together or many services with, will be connected together via the, via just like a road, a network of road connects say markets and uh, different shops, different uh, infrastructures together. So therefore the 5G is something like that, the infrastructure which can connect many things together, all right? Now, if we see what are the expectations, as I told that the network which is evolving from time to time, it becomes uh, smarter and more useful than the previous one. So here the expectation are, we will have to have very high data rate, very low latency, means very low delay uh, between having your data whenever you ask for it. And high capacity means it will be supporting say millions of devices or millions of sensors it can support and then there will be a variety of networks which needs to be supported because for each applications there will be maybe different type of networks will be there so 5g will have to provide support to variety of networks and then uninterrupted connectivity even when we are at hard high speed for example if we are going through a train or in a, say flight so there also you can have the access to the network so that will be ensured by the uh, 5G technology. So these are the main expectations or main characteristics of the 5G. Now, the use cases. So we know that uh, for 5G, we have first uh, devised or first uh, seen the use cases. And then that is the application scenarios. And then the standards and then the network parameters were derived. Now, the, for the 5G use cases, about 74 representative service scenarios were identified, means 75, uh, 74 type of applications. Something like, for example, in in um, smart city, there will be uh, many sensors which should be many sensors which should be connected together. For smart agriculture, also there should be many sensors connected together to give the inputs of um, smart agriculture or smart irrigations. 
for environment monitoring again there will be a huge number of sensors will be which needs to be joined together so a group of a group of applications where a large number of sensors needs to be uh, needs to be communicate with each other or communicate with a server so that thing gives rise to a massive iot uh, that is called mmtc that we will see in the next slide then another uh, part is enbb that is enhanced mobile broadband this means if someone is trying to say access some uh, augmented reality type of gaming or augmented reality type of uh, learning experience or virtual training so he or she should have required to access a large amount of data in a very short time so the broadband experience should be uh, the the bandwidth uh, that should be needed the amount of data that should be needed uh, to run those applications is tremendous so that is another type of applications where uh, large bandwidth is needed secondly there are some applications where ultra reliable low latency uh, type of network means very reliable type of networks are needed uh, for uh, uh, as service for example with connected cars or remote surgery uh, or uh, say signaling application so you cannot afford any delay in those networks at the same times it should be also reliable so that it doesn't fail and there can be also uh, the uh, the 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 requirement of a broadband in in those some of those situations so these type of applications 70 around 74 representative applications are categorized into these three broad cases and depicted by this diagram so here one one point of this triangle is enhanced mobile broadband another point is urllc that is ultra reliable low latency communications and another uh, point is uh, massive machine type communication massive machine type communication means where we need the smart sensors in, in large quantities like uh, sheep yards or as i told in uh, in precision agriculture or in health uh, uh, agricultural uh, monitoring or in environmental monitoring urllc is needed for factory automation or remote um, smart grid type of uh, systems and enhanced mobile broadband is needed for video transmission or a smart office or smart governance type of thing and some of the applications this part which needs both means embb and urllc are needed in this part that is the remote operation or for some medical uh, emergencies all the three are needed so there you need the enhanced mobile broadband and also the ultra reliable low latency communication and also uh, massive machine type communication are needed so these applications are very few but there are some applications which needs all these three components and there are some applications which needs only the where only the latency is important where only the uh, data is important and where only only the uh, only the number of uh, sensors are important okay so in this way uh, the 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 requirement of the network was chopped out now we go to the part to just see that how we will achieve that we have said that okay this 5g network will uh, give us this many type of uh, expectations we are having from the uh, from the 5g uh, network now in order to understand that we will have to just see a little bit in radio spectrum so this is uh, somewhat uh, this is called radio spectrum so as i told that the electromagnetic waves through which we will be communicating those are characterized by frequency okay so the lower frequency band so the unit of the frequency is hertz and the lower frequency if, if just like meters and kilometers so from hertz if we have 1000 hertz then we can we call it kilohertz then uh, for 10 to the power 6 hertz we call it megahertz and so on so in this way we go to 
kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz, like this. And uh, the portion of the radio wave, the electromagnetic spectrum, which is uh, required for communications, which are uh, required for many types of communications, is usually in the lower frequency band. This means which starts from, say, 3 kilohertz up to, say, 5 or 6 kilohertz. So there are many applications. For example, the radio, the radio means the, the radio which we can listen. So this radio operates in some kilohertz. Then the TV broadcast, it also uh, operates in some uh, kilohertz. Then there are these uh, remote control toys, then TV broadcasting station, cell phones, medical telemetry, etc. Everything, the police radar and uh, satellite communications, everything, they basically use the portion of the lower portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So where the penetration of the red electromagnetic wave is much higher. This means if we have a small energy of, of the signal or small amplitude, amplitude of the signal, it can travel up to a large distance in this uh, in these frequency bands. Therefore, these frequency bands are very popular. Okay. Now, we need to have in some applications as we have seen that we need to transmit a large amount of data. So, what happens when we want to transmit a large amount of data, the data goes through internet protocol these, these days. So these are something like uh, packets of data. Now, just imagine there is a narrow road and there are many traffic going on it. So what will happen eventually? The, all the traffic will get slowed because the road is narrow. Okay. So the same thing happens that if we want to transmit many information, through a small amount of frequency that is called, say, the higher frequency is FH and the lower frequency is FL, then if, if we just take the difference of the higher frequency to the lower frequency, we will get the bandwidth which we are using for sending our data. Okay. Now, if we use a very small piece of the bandwidth, then what happens? The amount of data we can send becomes limited. Now, as we are uh, trying to have as much data as we can transfer, so we need to have increase our bandwidth. So that we cannot do in a city like this, where there are many more already existing buildings. For example, here, there are many buildings, so there we cannot make a big road or large road. Okay, so if we have to make a large road, we'll go, have to go to the places where there are no buildings or where there are empty places. So like that, the, since the lower frequency bands are already congested with so many applications, we'll have to go up in the frequency to free a large number of uh, frequency bands. Okay, So therefore, people are talking to go to the higher frequency bands, which in context of 5G is called uh, millimeter wave bands. Okay? Now, the millimeter wave bands will have to move, but it doesn't need that we will need to have every applications in the millimeter wave band. So actually it will be in layered structure. So the first part, as we say that uh, the there will be many IoT type of applications, many sensors will be sending data. They actually, their number is much more higher, but they only need to transfer a little amount of data. So they don't need much bandwidth, but there should be capacity and there should be coverage. They can send so that they can send their signals over a large uh, area. So the sub one gigahertz layer, that would be the coverage layer. So here the most of the IoT applications, the internet of things applications or the sensors will use this layer. Then there will be a capacity layer, which will be between one to six gigahertz. So there everything is in the middle. We have a limit, um, medium amount of bandwidth so that we can send medium speed uh, data or medium amount of data and uh, it will be suitable for medium data rate applications and then there will be a high throughput layer uh, which is the millimeter wave frequency band that is 6 to 300 gigahertz any band in, in that uh, frequency range 
and here huge available bandwidth is there but the range is limited we cannot uh, transmit that data with uh, to a long range because the atmosphere will attenuate the signal okay so oh, and other things what will be happening is we also know that uh, we need very low latency so therefore what will happen that if we have uh, a cloud point uh, computing type of thing where the, our say sensors in this case this is a, a camera the camera is for example is uh, is recording some data and it has to some some events we need to identify if the camera sends the data to the cloud for a longer time so that will take much time so what happens in this case we are making the camera itself a little bit intelligent so that it can detect any event by itself so therefore only the decision can be transmitted so this is called edge computing because the camera is at the edge of the network okay so the camera can camera can um, compute or the camera can take its own uh, identify the own incidents so therefore it's called edge com computation so edge computation is needed to uh, to minimize the latency means the delay because whenever we are trying to uh, send much amount of data it will take much time and it will it will also uh, it will also an uh, increase in the network load okay and another uh, very important technology in 5G we are, uh, is envisaged that we will have the network, many slices of the network. It is the same network, but it will be, there will be many slices available. For example, if someone needs the mobile broadband, so he will be offered a slice of the network so that he can, he need not to go through all the network. So that will again, some something like it will have a shortcut path to the uh, to to the user and the server okay so therefore it will not have to travel through all the network protocols so it will it will see just a slice of the network so in this way every this three type of uh, three type of uh, uh, communication that is mobile broadband machine to machine communication and low latency communication each of them will have their own slices so that they don't have to travel through the whole network and this will eventually uh, reduce the delay time. Now we come to the impact. So up to now we have seen what are the expectations from the 5G network. Then we have seen how we can sum up the ways how we can achieve those. Now we see the impacts. The first thing uh, which is very exciting to see the uh, the invent of the UAV and the drones. So here we see the a formation of a uh, of an aeroplane by using the unmanned uh, the, the the drones the, uh, the the drones having some lights on it and this is the uh, previous Olympics this was uh, this was done but here you see that we are using a large number of drones which are communicating with each other at the same time it is communicating with the control and uh, so therefore this is a use case where the 5G network will be used and also this unmanned aerial vehicle type of uh, uh, type of applications are there which will be used for surveillance and also real time data from transfer from one part to another and the applications will be in security surveillance e-commerce and entertainment entertainment etc then the advent of the robots so here we see in a factory there are many robots which are working in tandem with each other so that uh, the the cars are being made with the with the robots and each of the robots they are connected to with each other as well as with the command center and there are many uh, such robots are working together so this is uh, this is one use case this is a cobot that is it is working with a researcher here so they together are uh, performing some uh, some research work and this is the famous sophia which is uh, um, which is the ai powered uh, robot and this is a robotic dog and these are the robots which are used in the uh, can be used in the uh, in the hotels or in the restaurants or in domestic applications so they all will can use 
some of the slices of the 5G network to be connected together. The other applications are the connected cards. So here we are seeing that uh, there are cards which are connected to each other, which are having real-time information of traffic from a network and which are also transmitting their position to the network. And also they're connected with each other. And then in the high speed trains, which will be also coming to our country and uh, uninterrupted, uh, uninterrupted access of internet through these trains or in the flight. So those things are all uh, will be possible with the uh, advent of 5G. And uh, some other, several other areas of impact will be the remote education through augmented reality or virtual reality. And then the smart cities, precision agriculture, environmental monitoring, smart healthcare, etc. Now coming to the summary, the 5G technologies is to provide seamless integration of several technologies as we have seen. And it will touch upon almost every aspects of our society. In the coming days, it has already started and it will touch upon almost every aspect of our society. And the technological evolution of 5G is to be continued towards maybe 6G and beyond. So these are all from my side and I must acknowledge that uh, several of these illustrations I have taken from internet and uh, the credits for those illustrations lies with the original creators. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. So we will wait for possibly one minute if there is any question uh, from from the viewers. And if not, then we will move to our next speaker. So I must say that it was really very interesting, and especially with this speed of technology yeah. and how it's shifting wow. uh, from say a technologically advancement in the era of technological advancement. 5G is a de definitely a game changer technology. So thank you very much for your insight and overall uh, giving us a, a brief but all valid ideas about 5G. Thank you very much. So uh, just for one minute, we will wait and then we'll go further. Meanwhile, if any of our panelists would like to ask anything from answer. So uh, can I now switch off the... Yes, 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 yes. So thank you. Thank you once more. And uh, with this, I would like to introduce our second speaker for the day is Dr. Rajendra Kumar Burma, who is working as a senior scientist in vacuum electron device development group of CSRC Hippilani. He has received his B degree from Institute of Engineering, Jivani University MP with a gold medal in 2011 followed by MTech in 2014 and PhD in 2020 from Academy of Scientific and Innovative Research, ACSIR. He is associated with microwave devices and vacuum electron tubes for more than eight years now. He is actively involved in the field of design and development of high power microwave and millimeter wave magnetron and associated components and subsystems. In addition, also he has also worked in quasi optical studies and its implementation to develop a free space calibration test setup at millimeter and sub millimeter and terahertz frequencies. His current research interests include design of high power microwave and millimeter wave devices, magnetrons, their thermal and electrical modeling and simulation, quasi optical components and system studies, design and development of microwave assisted cold plasma systems for biomedical applications. He has published more than 14 research publications in various international journals and conferences. Today, he will be talking in a very interesting topic. And the topic is electromagnetics, the journey from wires to wireless. With this, I request Dr. Burma to proceed from here. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Vijay. I'll just share my slides. Hopefully my slides are visible. Yes, 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 yes. So hello everyone. Today I have been given an opportunity to give a popular lecture 
on the topic electromagnetics, the journey from wires to wireless. In this talk, I will give you an essence of how the field of electromagnetics has developed by the efforts of numerous scientists and physicists working to understand charges and their property, and how this field of electromagnetics has changed the course of power transmission from wire cables to wireless transmission in free space through antenna. Starting our journey, we see we are living in a modern day world. In the modern day world, we are surrounded by numerous appliances and gadgets all around us. For a common nurse like us, we do not distinguish them in terms of electric devices or electronic devices. But for scientists, physicists, designers and engineers, they have a clear distinction of what device falls under the electrical domain and what falls under the electronic domain. The electrical components basically, basically comprises of uh, wires, coils, cells and batteries, windings and transformers. Whereas the electronic components comprises of diodes, transistors, integrated circuits, and IC chips. In modern day application, we use numerous devices, which electrical devices such as resistive heaters, hair dryers, iron, diesel rod, and numerous electrical devices. We are also surrounded by electronic devices and products such as our mobile phones our computers, smart watches, dish antenna, LED bulbs, LED TVs, and so on. All these modern appliances has been through a long journey of scientists working to develop them. It all started when scientists started working on understanding charges and the electrostatic phenomena. Some of us who have also encountered these natural phenomena in nature like a thunder, thunder strike. Or you might have experienced a small spark between your hand and a metal body when you try to touch a metal body. Or a small scale rubbed at your ears which can pick up paper pieces. For all of us, it all appears to be magic. And so does for the people back in the days. It was till then when Charles Augustine de Coulomb started to think why these physical phenomena are happening in a certain fashion. And he devised a theory out of it. He said that let us imagine a physical entity and he called those entities as charges. These charges had certain fields associated with them and he called that field as electric field. The interaction of this field the charges fields results in a response which he said was a force. So then he devised a theory that if we have a charge Q1 and we have a charge Q2 and then respective electric field associated with respective charge, that charge will have a force of attraction or a force of repulsion. And this theory came out to be known as the Coulomb's theory of electrostatics. Building on this theory, Count Alexander Volta. He said if the charges are interacting with each other, they are doing some sort of work within themselves and he called that work as potential difference and he coined the potential difference formula and built up the con concept of capacitor. This theory was then put to a physical phenomenon where the cloud rubs against each other and they accumulate charge on them. When the charges are separated by a distance, they de develop a voltage across them and capacitor is developed capacitor action is formed. Once the charge accumulation is so high that the capacitor cannot hold it, a discharge takes place and that discharge we see as thunderbolt or thunder lightning. So this is how scientists were able to explain a natural phenomena by science and understanding the properties of charges. Once this property of charges was understood, they, made, they were able to say that charges can flow, which resulted in electricity and electric current. Based on electricity and electric current, people were, or scientists were able to make applications like lightening a bulb through a wire cable, or making cells, or making batteries. This was the effort of George Simon Holmes, 
who started working on the concept of electric current and gave the most famous Hobbes law. He took a voltage or a battery and he connected the terminals of the battery with wires or a conductor. The current started to flow in the wires and based on the geometry of the conductor, it offers a resistance. And hence, he was able to give the Ohm's law. He was also able to tell that the resistance offered by the conductor depends on its physical appearance. By this concept, Gustav Robert Kritschow, who was also one of the scientists, he started understanding that electrical circuits can be formed by connecting batteries, resistances, and wires. And hence, he started doing electric circuit analysis. And he gave the most famous Kirchhoff's current law, KCL, and Kirchhoff's voltage law, KVL, where he said that the total incoming current coming to a node is equal to the total outgoing current. And he also started doing electric circuit analysis by KVL, saying that the voltage applied in the circuit breaks, up, breaks down or drops across the resistance in a loop, which is known to be the KVL. Once it was understood that wires can carry current, people started doing power transmission using conducting cables or wire cables. They started putting certain amount of power on the cable line and the current started to flow. But they were able to see that the resistance of the conducting wire was making the energy go down as per the distance. So, the power started to be very high, and as the power flows, the conductor gets heated because of the I square R losses, and hence the energy reduces or the power reduces the distance. So the power transmission to wire cables could be done for short distances. But now the scientists understood that electrical current can flow through conducting wires, and we can do power transmission and many industrial applications were implemented by this concept. So when the charges started to move, they have different properties associated with them. And that property came out to be known as magnetism. Based on moving charges and magnetism, many applications or many devices were developed. Some of the examples is a transformer or a metal detector. You might have experienced a security guard checking you with a piece of gadget in his hand, which is based on the concept of moving charges and magnetism. It is called as a metal detector. The experiment of this particular phenomena was started by Hans Christian Olsted, where he started flowing a current through a conducting wire. And he experienced that the compass shows a deflection. And he was able to see that a current carrying conductor results in a generation of magnetic field around it. And it was later, the theory, the theory was developed by Henry Anton Lawrence and who gave the Lawrence force equation. And Henry Ampere also built upon the experiment and said, and gave the Ampere circuital law. He said that if a current is flowing through a conductor, then a magnetic field will be produced around it. And if you how much the magnetic field is being in, you can understand through this formula, which says that if you have a loop of wire, that is DL, and you integrate the magnetic field inside the wire, or inside the loop, you can estimate the amount of current flowing into the wire. This is the physical interpretation of a mathematical formulation. And by this theory, Peak scientists were able to estimate that it is not just the conducting losses which is making the energy go down, it is also the radiation of energy which was taking place around the wire because of the magnetic field that is leading to the loss of energy. And it was the crucial time when scientists were able to understand that uh, not only the conductors were carrying current they were also radiating in free space. That is, a current flowing through the conductor was able to generate a space bearing magnetic field into the space. Now, the scientists were able to conclude that magnetism and electro electrostatic or electricity, they are not independent entities. Instead, they were interlinked with each other. 
based on this theory, Carl Frederick Gauss gave us the Gauss law, where he states that if in a volume like this, that is the volume of the conductor, if there is a charge separation inside the volume of the conductor, then the total amount of charge, the total amount of charge decide how much the electrical entity is going to come out of the volume or go into the volume. This was known as the Gauss law. Once the scientists understood that electricity and magnetism are not independent entity, they coined the term electromagnetic. Electromagnetic basically means that it comprises of two words, electrostatic and magnetostatic. And now it's a coupled phenomena. Many of the modern day devices or equipments that you see based on electromagnetic induction are shown over here. When you have seen an EC generator outside a building, a bank, or some space to give a power supply or emergency supply. And we might have seen an induction cooker that you use in your day to day life here to it. The load which is connected to the coil starts to lit. This was the experiment conducted by Faraday, where he connected the terminals with a bulb. And he gave this formula that the rate of the magnetic flux, if the magnetic flux changes with time, then an induced EMF will be formed in the second coil. Mathematically, he gave this particular equation. To understand this particular equation, you basically take a coil and you generate a magnetic field by flowing an AC signal into the coil. Now this magnetic field, when you bring closer to a another coil, you are bringing a surface near to the magnetic field. Now the magnetic field will cross through the surface and hence if you integrate or add, add up this magnetic field, you will be able to estimate the left half portion of the equation. And this magnetic field will result in generation of an electric field between these two terminals. And once the electric field is set, it will result in flow of the electric current across the circumference or the loop of the coil. And hence, a physical phenomena is taken down into mathematical equation like this. The same physical phenomena happens when you cook your food on an induction heater. The induction heater contains the coil which generates the magnetic field. The magnetic field from the induction coil couples to the other coil which is your utensil. The other coils, the other coils cut through the magnetic field of the induction cooker and generates eddy current loops. This eddy current loops generate heats and by that heat your food gets cooked. So this is how a physical phenomena was put into a day-to-day -day appliances. In the electromagnetic godfather, his name was James Clark Maxwell, who summed up all the equations with, that was given in by previous scientists. He summed up the Gauss law in electrostatic. It states that the total charge in any of the entity will result in emission of electric flux density in the from the volume. It means physically it means if you have a bucket and it has certain meters of water, when you open the tap, only that much amount of water is going to come out, how much is stored in your bucket. In the same way, the total net charge inside a volume will result in an electrical quantity coming out of the volume or sinking into the volume. The second Gauss law in magnetostatic states that the magnet, if broken down into two pieces, will still result in north pole and a south pole. That is, a single monopole cannot exist. The Faraday, Faraday law states that if you have a magnetic field, which is time varying in nature, generated by an AC signal, it can result in a space varying electric field. That is, a magnetic field of one coil can be coupled to the other coil through spatial distance also. And there was Ampere's law, which states that if you have a conducting wire and you flow an electric current through it, then a magnetic field around the wire can be generated. 
But the Maxwell's greatest contribution was he gave the example of capacitor and he said, even though the plates are separated apart, still the current flows through them. And hence, we do not require a conductor to flow an electric current. But even the current can flow without the absence, in the absence of the conductor as well, or in free space. And it was this insight and this addition of rho by rho t of d by Maxwell that opened up the field of free space communication. Maxwell's greatest achievement was he unified all the equations of electrostatic and magnetostatic and gave an incremental change that even in the absence of the conductor, the electric current can flow. And it was Jagdish Chandra Bose and Martini who were said to be the pioneers of radio transmission. A small change made by Maxwell opened up a huge band of wireless transmission. This whole radio spectrum was opened for applications like EM radio, FM radio transmission, mobile communication, radar communication, wireless communication, and so on. It was a radical step moving from wired communication to wireless communication, or be called as radio communication. Once we knew, or once scientists knew, that now we can have free space communication, we need to have RF generator or radio frequency generator. Now, these generators are basically triode based generators, space traveling wave tubes, magnetrons, klystrons, and gyrotrons. The significant difference of these generators from the conventional AC generators are AC generators can generate frequency of 50 hertz or maximum power of 10,000 watts, whereas for radio or vacuum electron devices generators, they can work at gigahertz frequency range and give a power of about megawatt level. Devices or RF power generators have a significant term attached to this, which is called as vacuum electron devices. The concept of vacuum can be understood from this uh, illustration. While in wireless communication, you were connecting two terminals by a conducting medium and the electron was flowing into the medium, the electron was doing collisions with the atoms of the medium and hence it was dissipating or losing its heat to the conducting medium. Whereas in vacuum technology, the terminals of the cathode and the anode are separated with having no mediums in between them. So the electrons can move faster as well as it doesn't lose its energy in going from cathode to anode. And that was the significant benefit of vacuum technology over conducting medium. The potential applications of vacuum electron devices can be for many sectors like strategic sectors, medical sectors, and industrial sectors. Some of the applications I will be discussing over here. The first application that vacuum electron devices are used is in radar systems. The radars are basically an eye of strategic sectors where they can detect whether an enemy is coming near to you or not. So the concept lies over here that from an RF source or a vacuum electron device source, the electromagnetic energy is generated which is sent into the atmosphere through a transmitter. Instant energy falls onto the target and is reflected back to the receiving antenna. Now, using the simple formula of speed is equal to distance upon time, all the electromagnetic radiation travels with the speed of light and the two-way time of sending the signal and receiving the signal is known Hence, the distance can be calculated. This particular phenomena is being used by militaries, navy, and all the strategic sectors to keep an eye on the enemy. And this is called as a radar application. The same application is being used for weather radars and air traffic control radars. The second important application of vacuum electron devices 
is in medical and security purposes. To scan these containers or cargo scanners, we basically use a linear accelerator where a low energy electron is subjected to microwave energy, which is then becomes the high ele energy electrons. When this high ele energy electron strike the tungsten metal, they generate X-rays. These X-rays can be used to cargo scan these containers and see whether they are transporting any illegal goods or any human tra trafficking is being taken place. You can also, these X-rays can also be used for medical treating patient with cancer. So the, for treating patients having cancer, normally chemotherapy is used. In chemotherapy, chemicals are given to the cancer patient and hence the good cells of the body are also affected. Whereas radiation therapy using medical linings is a control method of treating cancer patient. And hence, it is an important application of vacuum electron devices. In terms of industrial heating of vacuum electron devices, it can be understood how the microwave heating takes place. Many of us know that water molecule is a polar molecule having two hydrogen positive atom and one oxygen negative atom. When this polar molecule is subjected to a changing RF or a changing EC signal, then it vibrates with the same frequency as that of the AC signal. This vibration of the water molecule produces heat and hence if you vibrate it at a very high frequency that is of the order of 10 to the power 9 hertz, then the generation of heat will be very high. This phenomena of water vibration and generation of heat is used in industrial heating. One of the most common and the most uh, important application of vacuum electron devices is domestic microwave oven. It is also used in industrial heating system where it is used for drying teas and spices. In SIR series, we develop magnetrons in various bands of X band and S band, and hence we develop numerous magnetrons for radar applications. The illustration basically shows the difference of frequency and the power. Where you have a domestic supply which has a frequency of 50 hertz, and you have it, whereas on the other hand, the magnetrons generates gigahertz of frequency and power of megawatt level. We also developed at CSIR CD klystrons. Numerous klystrons have been developed of the order of having output power of megawatt levels and have been delivered to numerous agencies like DRDO and BRC. Another vacuum electron device that we developed at CSIR CD is gyrotrons. One of the activities that as a student you might have done is to concentrate the solar radiation on a paper and to burn it. The same concept is being used in industrial heating system where the power from the gyrotron is being concentrated to melt or form the steel bars which are very high in thickness. The same tendency of microwave heating is being used in international thermonuclear experiment ITER program of the world where the energy from the RF is being used to generate heat which uh, operates the turbine and generates electricity. Gyrotron has huge demands in strategic and energy sectors because of these applications. As you, you, uh, you might have heard about satellite communication and TV broadcasting or direct to home services. The vacuum electron device that is used in satellite communication is traveling wave tube. And here at CSIR CV, we develop numerous traveling wave tubes in KU band, C band, and KA band. We also develop plasma devices, which are thyrotrons and this DVD lamps. For students' perception, you might have seen a switchboard having a switch which can handle 230 volts of voltage 
and around 20 amperes of current. But what happens if the current goes to the level of 5000 amperes and the frequency is around 1 gigahertz? We cannot use this kind of switch and hence high power handling switches are required. Thyrotrons are high power handling switches which are developed at CSIR CD. A common plasma devices that you see in your day-to-day -day life are this tube lights or glow signs at the hotels, which are actually glass tube filled with certain gas and when electric current is applied, they start to glow. In the same way, we develop this dielectric barrier discharge lamps here in CSR series, which is used for generating UV radiation used for water or water purification. The various application of plasma devices are they are used for sterilization purposes because they generate UV radiations. Other futuristic application of vacuum electron devices are space solar power station. In space solar power station, basically it is a futuristic approach towards harvesting the solar energy. The solar energy that we receive on the earth passes through various layers of the atmosphere and hence it gets reduced. As you can see, that one meter square of area in the solar or in the space gives the, uh, gives the required energy which is given by 43 meter square area on the earth. And hence, it is a profitable manner to actually harvest the solar energy in space. The concept is to convert the solar energy using solar panel into electrical signal. This electrical signal will be converted to microwave signal and once the microwave which can be transmitted through the atmosphere with little attenuation reaches the earth station where the reverse is applied and the microwave energy is converted to electrical signal and hence the solar harvesting will be much more efficient. Another application of between electron devices is terahertz human screening. Normally, when you go to an airport or you go to a railway station, your luggage can be scanned by X-rays, but it is but you cannot be scanned by X-rays because X-rays are ionizing radiation. So, to have human screening done at airports and railway stations, this is a type of screening that uses terahertz frequency signals. The terahertz frequency signal will give an image of a person which will be useful for screening person. Since the terahertz radiations are non-ionizing radiation, the human can be scanned at security checks. And I would like to give this message to you that you have it all within you. And this picture is a complete representation of what I mean to say by that. Suppose you see a phenomena that happens in nature and you make an observation. At that point, you are being a student or a learner. Now, your mind starts to think about all the possible reasoning of what happens and put your hypothesis and theories for making a particular theory for that phenomena. At that point, a scientist or a physicist. Now, learning from that theory, you make technologies and devices based on the theory of the phenomena and at that point you are being an engineer and designer. So it is you who have the capability to be a student, a scientist or physicist or to be an engineer and designer and all these roles can be done by you. So there are no special people, everyone can be everything but you need to have an observant eye. With these words I would like to thank you all and hope this uh, talk gave you the essence of electromagnetics and gave you the zeal to work on this field and develop innovative devices. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Verma. It was indeed a very informative lecture and you have covered from history to future. And, uh, almost all the corners you have covered and that too covered very nicely. I must say, and uh, while we are waiting for some questions, maybe from the audience, uh, 
like the application part was really very uh, good you know like you have touched safety and security of any country through these kind of devices whether it is health sector or the industrial application everywhere these these devices have applications and also the insight of research that you people are doing in csr cd that is also tremendous so like it is very nice and also the technology like uh, how promising these technologies are for the future and uh, overall like uh, keeping a track of everything within this limited time it's really wonderful really wonderful i'm looking for some questions if at all like uh, getting posted on the chat box otherwise uh, thanks thanks to you so just we'll wait for one minute this one for the audience for the students this is lecture 3 of the popular lecture series of jigyasa we have many more in our bank so please be updated as time progress we have gained a lot in these two lectures for the 5g technology like impact and expectation and this electromagnetics the journey from wires to wireless is these lectures are like the gist of all the important works people around the globe is working like they are doing and one single platform i think this is really nice from our speakers to update all those information in a single platform and deliver it so like uh, in a very easy and like understandable manner i think uh, Uh, this makes this session really very great if there is any questions from the uh, audience i would like the speakers to react on those questions okay so so i i hope still we haven't got any questions so thank you thank you uh, dr parma and uh, the previous speaker dr ayan kumar bandopadhyay so thank you very much hope we continue this journey and we will take more of your kind of you know time to prepare the lectures for future also thank you thank you thank you yeah thank you thank you thank you sir thank you